Hi there. We are Jim and Jonna Schuster, and this is a glimpse into our world. Conversations from our living room. Unscripted, without agenda, prompted by the Holy Spirit. And usually over coffee. About what God is saying to us right now. No promises on what you'll get. Rev bombs, rants, breakthroughs, victories. It's all fair game. But we hope it's a place of encountering the depths of the Lord together. So come explore with us here on the Catholic Revival Ministries podcast. Hello, friends. We are back with part two of our conversation with Deacon Keith Strom, coming to us from the Archdiocese of Chicago and M3 Ministries. You can catch the first part of this conversation in episode seven, The Need for Jesus. But with Keith, there is never a shortage of interesting and insightful discussions to be had. So there was no way we were going to fit everything into one podcast. So let's go ahead and dive back in now with part two. In the work that you've done in helping people like hear words of knowledge and, and that, what's like an obstacle that you often encounter for people that they have to overcome in order to begin to operate in that? First one. Uh, and this is just any kind of hearing God's voice, whether it's for words of knowledge or just even in prayer. I think the initial biggest one is just, how do I know that's really God? Like mm-hmm. if I'm listening and, I, and something comes to mind, how do I know it's really God? Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just making something up. That's maybe not the first one. We have a little little groundwork to do before that. But but a lot of times that's that's an obstacle. And we always tell them, like, it's a matter of having some trust. Like, this is the way that God speaks. When people talk about hearing God in prayer, their experience is the same as yours right now. Like, it's, you right. know, so, you know, and so much of it is just asking people, you know, getting to learn from what's going on, on the inside of other people who are experiencing the kind of life that we want to be living. So like right. going and finding out, like, what is that actually like for you? What, um, what did it look like? And uh, so trusting that it is from the Lord, but then also just building a history and saying, well, in this particular moment, we're not going to know entirely until you kind of walk it out and see what the fruit of it is. But the more you build a history, the more you start to recognize the consistency of the way that the Lord speaks with yeah. you. And and that, I think that gives you some courage to just do it again, right? So I know yeah. the Lord uses me in this way, so I'm willing to just step out. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten to the point where, because my discernment is not perfect in any stretch of the imagination, and so like if I'm a lot of times I do this, like if I'm feeling like, oh, this person's got like back issues, like I'm just sensing that, right? I'll be like, All right, so do you, you know, do you have back issues? And they'll be like, no, my back's perfectly fine. Right. Yeah. And I'm able to just not dwell on it and go, oh, I, you know, I blew that and I'm the worst. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. oh, it must be great to be young. Like if the person's younger than, than I am. Right. And then I just <laughs> move on to other parts of the conversation. Right. But I just trust that more often than not, if I make myself available, there will be a word from the Lord. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Jonna, what what would you say? Well, I would say that's definitely a problem that exists in people wanting to hear from the Lord is the the doubt of mm-hmm. um, whether or not they, they are or they could. But I would say that the people, by the time they reach us and our ministry, they actually already believe that they can hear from the Lord. They just need yeah. to know how. Okay. And so there's, when I'm doing the coaching one-on-one with people, there's a willingness to hear from the Lord and they're, you know, very eager to figure it out. But what ends up getting almost surfaced through that is almost a a question of God's character and his goodness. Because one mm-hmm. of the things that we teach is how to identify if it's if you're hearing from the Lord or if you're hearing from the enemy or if yeah. it's just, you know, a neutral thought. And we teach on if what you hear in prayer doesn't line up with the nature and character of God as seen in the life of Jesus, right. then likely not from the Lord. And that's a big stumbling block for some people because their instinct is to jump in and say, well, but Job was asked to suffer. And, you know, Abraham was asked to give up his only son. And like all of these Old Testament examples to debunk why God is actually good and that his nature is not to give the tough love and, you know, that sort of thing. And so helping to recalibrate people's expectations and their understanding and their mindset on what is the heart of God and looking at Jesus as the perfect example of that. We're not looking at the Old Testament examples because that is a partial revelation of who God is. Jesus is the right. full revelation of who God mm-hmm. is. And we're having to almost clarify that to almost um, purify what it is that they're hearing from the Lord or they think they're hearing from the Lord based on 
you know, do they believe that God is going to come in with a heavy hand and he's going to be dropping shame grenades on them and, you know, trying to motivate them through manipulation and, yeah. and that sort of thing? Or is he actually coming with kindness and love and compassion and, and that being the filter on discerning his voice? I, that's beautiful, right? And that's so true. Yeah, I think, you know, I, this idea of God's goodness and, and are they going to come through with a voice of shame, right? No, I think for personal discernment, I think that's critical. But I also think sometimes we are very quick to speak words of correction yeah. into yeah. other people's lives that might bring shame yeah. as well, right? And, we, and, and kind of be motivated by, well, it's, it's the tough love, right? Um, and so we have to be, I think we have to be really careful about that and just giving, if we can just stay rooted in the heart of the father, right. We know that the father is, is love and kindness. And, and I don't think we'll, we will have a tendency to to not stray too far, but if we got this old Testament kind of image or, or even this wounded image based on our own experience of, right. Then I think we might be more ready to like, you know, throw hand grenades into people's lives when they don't necessarily need it in, in the guise of being prophetic. Yeah. Or yeah. in the guise of fraternal correction, like, oh, yeah. it's my job to fraternally correct someone mm-hmm. who is in error because I'm keeping them from going right. astray or I'm, you know, right. bringing them back to Lord and that sort of thing. And kind of what I, what I teach my students is there's a place for tough love, but there's a specific place for it. So it's reserved for the relationships that you already have trust built up with the person. Tough love isn't appropriate unless there's already tender love. I, like you I, have oh, to have that as the so default. Good. Otherwise, yeah. you're just coming in as a police officer. And yep. really I might feel that. That's how good that is. That's great. I love that, Jonna. Right? Tough love. Right? Can't happen until there's tender love. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, even the other day, I was um, I was at Starbucks and I saw uh, up on the wall, there was kind of the sheet of paper with the little tabs at the bottom, kind of like, if you're looking for a babysitter, take it, you know, take a tab or whatever. But this one, the tabs were affirmations. Oh, they were, they were like things like I'm, I'm confident, I'm capable, you know, like just think like I, I am not my mistakes, you know, Mm -hmm. things like that. And, and I was looking at that and it kind of stirred me to, it prompted me to reflect, you know, there's something that's been stirring in me a lot, or I've been observing a lot like lately that most of the people that I know don't need help becoming aware of their faults. Yep. Like, right. Most of the people I know are very, very aware of where they fall short, their weaknesses, their problems and whatnot. And most people actually need help loving themselves well. Yeah. And, you know, I I heard a story a while back. I think I might have seen somebody post this. It was actually a priest who was maybe about three years into his ministry. And he said, you know, three years ago when I was a seminarian about to be ordained a priest, if you would have told me then that the thing that people need most is to learn how to love themselves. I, I would have called you crazy. But after three years of ministry and three years in the confessional, this is the theme that keeps coming up over and over and over yeah. again. I'm really convinced that this is one of the most important things we can do as a church. And yeah. and I think that just, I think he's spot on. And, and it's so reflective of, again, what John was talking about, the nature of God as displayed in the life of Jesus. What do we mm-hmm. see over and over again in the life of Jesus? We yeah. ki- see kindness and goodness. And I've been, the whole time we were getting ready for this podcast, I was like, who gets to bring up the chosen? Because <laughs> <laughs> I love this this series on, yes. you know, the life of Jesus, which is really called the chosen. It's really kind of an emphasis on the the disciples, yeah. which is really beautiful. Right. I, I love everything about this series, but in this, in this context, the thing I love is just the way that Jesus is portrayed. Mm-hmm. There's so much kindness that he just brings yeah. to everybody he meets and he, he approaches and he's constantly, you know, the people he's interacting with who are the big sinners, right? right. You know, the thing that he's always doing is addressing them in their point of shame and, and just bringing kindness and love there. He just, right right for the root of it. And it's displayed so, so beautifully. And I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, this, this and, again, I, 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 think to, I go to, to kind of add on to that. You were, sure. you were talking earlier about, about healing being integral to the whole message of the gospel and the whole yeah. thing. Right. And, and this is, I think, you know, we can just talk about healing on all levels. Jesus is healing spiritually. Okay. We are, we all are like, okay with that, but there's also just this emotional component and like 
I think one of the reasons that it is so integral is because it is such an opportunity to actually experience the true nature and the true heart of God is ah, uh, he actually isn't coming with a stick to beat me. Yeah. He yeah. is actually coming with love and tenderness in my most fearful and shameful and vulnerable place. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I Again, I think it's it comes down to, you know, in order to love ourselves, first of all, I think we have to know that we are loved. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I think that's so, yeah. uh, on some level, right? And so this is really, again, it comes back to identity, yeah. right? Uh, that if I know the heart of the father, if I know the father's goodness yeah. and I know, you know, when I do parish missions, I start off every parish mission to, you know, we talk about what God is love, but what does that really mean? I mean, that's a radical statement, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if God is love and that's his nature, yeah. then we, by our very nature, are those who are loved by God, right? Our nature is beloved, mm. right? Yeah. Before everything that we do. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so the two, this kind of sense of who God is and who we are in him are linked together. Yeah. And once we begin to encounter the love of the father, it begins to have an impact on, on how we see ourselves as well. Yeah. Um, I want to challenge something because I think there are plenty of people in the church who agree with that statement. Theologically, it is a truth. But what's happened is I think the word love and I think the word goodness have actually been distorted mm -hmm. in our culture because we're trying to reconcile brokenness that we see in the world. We're trying to reconcile the things that have not been restored to what they ought to be with the fact that we have a good God. And so I think the solution that people have come to is, well, if I can't reconcile a good God with the brokenness I see, then we need to tweak the word good. And so to say that God being good allowed this thing to happen or mm -hmm. permitted it by his passive will or whatever and we we lose the integrity of that word. We lose the integrity of the word good and um, the word love, because again, that whole tough love twist. And so I think part of what we need to do as a culture is not just remind people of their belovedness, but I actually think we need to bring the plumb line back. We need to actually tell remind people of the definition of those words and that those definitions yeah. don't change because we're trying to make sense of our broken circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's wise. The, this I, this idea of God's goodness was it was it was radically transformative for me, mm. um, but only really after I encountered it. Mm. Yeah, right. I, I mean, the, the theoretical, yeah, okay, God's good, I get that, right? Yeah. But I'm I'm just trying to get through my life, yeah. right? Uh, and then I had uh, when I was 23, 24, I had this incredible encounter with the love of the Father that shifted and changed everything for me. Yeah. And um, it, it really restored my own identity. And that's when I really knew God's goodness. But but even after that experience, this is how, how crazy it is. There's so much healing that needs to be done. Even after that experience, 20 years after that experience, I was receiving prayer from an individual and she had just this prophetic word. And literally, it was a very simple word. It was just like, you know, the Father wants you to know that he delights in you. Wow. And just that word spoken over my heart that broke this dam. And I just started like weeping, wow. right? Because I was like, oh, I'm not doing this good enough. I'm not doing that good enough. I'm just, you know, I I'm not living, you know, I, I was the director of evangelization. I'm like, I'm not doing that in the way I should. And, mm. and it was like all these things. And just that one word, that, that one sentence just changed everything for me as yeah. well in that moment. And so I think it's a message that we need to we need to experience, we need to encounter, and it needs to be repeated. We, you know, we need to kind of speak into people's lives with that, yeah, with that message. Yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. like those affirmations that Jim was talking about. We I love that. We yeah. might learn it once in grade school. We might mm -hmm. know it as a theological principle, but we need to be reminded of that because like you said, those lies from the enemy or from other people who've spoken things over us, we need those truths to come and become our, uh, our foundation again. Mm -hmm. I, fundamentally, I, I mean, I agree with you. This is, it, it, it's, it's hard to speak of the goodness of God to people who have never encountered the goodness of God, yeah. even in a way that they can understand because they've encountered the goodness of God. Clearly they're alive, right? Right. Right. They, they're breathing. They have a heartbeat. They, they've been created out of the goodness of God, but to, to recognize, to help them recognize that. Yeah. Right. I, I think can be so, so powerful for people. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I, I'm still, I'm still fixated on this kind of 
pull down thing with all these affirmations. I want to go do that in different places. Yeah. yeah. I would love if we could become a church known for yeah. our kind. I mean, like that's what scripture says. The people of God will be known by their love, yeah. not, not by their, you know, articulate words, not by their religious performances, not, you know, that it's by their love. And I, I would love it if we as a church could be those, you know, we could walk around handing those things out and, you know, Hey, yeah. you're loved, you're, you know, cherished, you're yep. beloved, you're chosen, whatever. I think part of it too, is that we're at least in the 21st century in the United States, which is obviously my main context, but North America, I think it is partially because we're trapped in a war where we, we are locked into a culture war. Right. And I, and I tell people it is really hard to evangelize a culture you believe you're at war with. Oh, right. Oh, wow. So oh, true. So how, how, you know, because for many people, it's about, we got to get everyone to believe the right things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I don't think that that's bad in a sense. Right. But, and so we see this so often, like that, that we speak words of correction first. Yeah. Yeah. So there's tough love before tender love, right? We don't, we don't exhibit tender love because it's kind of seen as, you know, like th- there, there is an apostolic tension. This is what Sherry Waddell talks about a lot. There's a tension that we experience, we should experience when we meet people in the world who are broken, who are hurting, who are, who might feel lost or, uh, and, and we want to meet them where they're at, mm-hmm. yeah. right? And, and they might be in terrible moral situations, mm-hmm. right? So there's this tension because we want to be faithful but mm-hmm. Sherry says, right, the primary call of laymen and women is to faithfulness, to be faithful to Christ as he reveals himself in his church, but to be faithful to Christ as he reveals himself in the person in front of us. Mm. Yeah. And so sometimes there's going to be that tension because there's no easy solution to you meet a drug addict on the street who's homeless. Yeah. yeah. Right. In many ways, the, the, the ministry and the life, uh, the, the mission of laymen and women is a lot more complex than the mission of the ordained. Oh yeah. Like our, my primary call is to obedience. So, uh, and so I, I, my ministry is prescribed. If I'm going to baptize someone, I know I'm going to baptize it with water and not milk. And I'm going to use the, mm-hmm. you know, in the, I'm going to use the, the phrase in the name of the father, son, and Holy spirit and not create a redeemer and sanctifier. It's all written. Right. But for laymen and women, you don't have a Roman missile that'll tell you everything you need to do. Hold on. I'll, I'd love to help you. Let me turn to page 75. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then read the rubrics. And so you, so there's this tension. And faithful Catholics will often feel like they're not being faithful to the, mm-hmm. to the teaching of the church if they don't hammer the theology of the body on someone who's, you know, trapped in a like in serial adulterous relationships, right? Or, and and we've got to find a way to check that impulse and really live out of how do we be Jesus in that moment for them? Because yeah. admonish the sinner is a work of mercy, but sometimes we we sort of put that one as number one. Yeah. Um, before like comfort the afflicted. Yeah. 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 (laughs) I love the way that Sean Bowles puts it. He's, I've heard him say before, God will never give you authority to influence a person or a people group that you don't love. Mm. If you can't love them, if you can't, you know, stir up compassion towards them, God's not going to trust you with the responsibility of bringing an influence over them. Yeah, That's beautiful. You know, it's having his heart well to them. That's, that's a really beautiful. I know um, Cardinal George, the ordinary here in Chicago, he, he said it. He said, you can't evangelize what you don't love. Yeah. Right. And so and so you think about it, even like in like people in, in the pro-life movement, right? Those who work in an abortion clinic, yeah. we're called to love them. Now, loving them does also mean, hey, we've got to kind of show them, hey, this is this is what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. Right. But it may not be the the wisest thing to be the first move we make in their life, right? I always tell people, think of any relationship you have in your life that you still have. It probably didn't begin with you telling the other person all the things they needed to change about themselves for them yes. to be acceptable to you, Yeah. right? So uh, so living in that the tenderness of God, I, that's for me has been a, a real, that's been an eye-opener for me just even the last couple of years in doing ministry, right? Is that I really have to ask the Lord for his heart. Yeah. yeah. Right. We need his heart to minister out of. And and again, recognizing that his heart is in one sense been given to us. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we can so we can live in that. Yeah. Um, Have you ever had experiences an... where you actually were finding it difficult 
and you were reminded of that or brought back to that place and you you kind of like had to shift into or you found maybe you allowed the lord to to give you his heart for somebody where you didn't have it before yeah this is going to be an extreme example sometimes i have extreme examples um this is why i don't always tell all my stories to people i'm just going to lay it out there it was one of the very first times i was assisting in the rite of exorcism mm. and the gentleman that that we were praying with was deeply uh deeply possessed and he himself had this gentle, wonderful heart, hmm. but we were dealing with other things. And, um, I remember being really, it was the first time I, I was ever in the, the formal rite. And I remember being a little uncomfortable and then a little afraid. Like it, it was just because it was intense. There was a lot of manifestations. And then about halfway through, things shifted. Hmm. And I recognized that wow, this is a beloved son of God who is suffering deeply. Wow. Right. And that's when everything shifted for me. Once I had that, 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 that once the Lord reminded me, this one is one of mine. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I really began to have the heart of the father for him. I began to weep in the middle of the, wow. of the right, but I wasn't afraid. Right. And so we, I, 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 it was, and so amazingly he's become, one of my favorite people to pray with. And, and just because uh, every time I see him, I have this wave of the father's heart. Hmm. Right. And, and he's a wonderful man who suffered deeply, but uh, it's so, it's so easy to get caught up in the, the surface stuff, right? Here's the stuff that, you know, you're dealing with. Um, So I had similar experience, way less extreme, but recently I've, I think the Lord's just been training my heart in how to, respond to people who are um, critical and unkind and that sort of thing. And um, I think there was a grace that actually kicked in for me to be able to actually understand this and move forward with it. But I realized I sometimes will get messages from people that are accusatory or unkind in nature. And my reflex is I want to defend myself. I want to make it clear who I am, what I stand for, what I don't stand for. I want to make sure that their their understanding is right or accurate according to who I am. And I came to realize recently that actually that's not the battle that needs to be fought. It's not supposed to be about me making myself known, but it's actually more about when that person comes at me with hostility or with anger or with hatred or whatever, or with pain, it's actually because they're suffering. Like there's, Mm -hmm. there's an experience of, I don't know if it's you know, like Jim was saying, there's maybe some self-hatred involved or there's something they're experiencing a pain and they don't have anywhere to put it. They don't have anywhere to release it. And so it's coming out of them in their interaction with me. And so the worst thing that I can do is to come in with an equally harsh statement or defensive, because that's only going to aggravate, you know, if you think of it as they're afflicted by a principality, right? if they're suffering from the principality of fear and they're, you know, speaking out against me and accusing me and I come in and I, you know, accuse them back or I, you know, do something like that, that's actually only going to aggravate their fear even more. And so it's actually the more strategic move to come in with love, to come in with kindness. And so anybody who's acting out in strong emotion, it's actually more beneficial for them. It's also Jesus's way, but I'm understanding why now it's actually right. because it's disarming and it's diffusing mm-hmm. to bring love into a situation where there are high emotions and there's high um, woundedness or pain coming out of a person. Yeah. I, that's beautiful. When we talk about the accompanying people and, and not yet building trust, right? We, that, that people don't have a trusting relationship yet. We often say that, that, you know, trust has to be built and people who aren't yet in trust, they don't want to dialogue with you. Yeah. They, they just want to be heard. Yeah. Right. They, they don't want to argue. They want to be often, they want to be heard. Yeah. And if we can find a space to just create that without getting defensive, mm-hmm. right? This is why, like, I think apologetics are beautiful but I think often they're not the most fruitful at the beginning of a relationship that you have with someone who might not, unless they're, you know, I say very few people are argued into the kingdom of God. Right. Um, uh, And although those who are probably have like a Dominican vocation somewhere. (laughs) So so maybe, you know, that could be the way they, they process, right. Some people go, you get through the heart, through the head. 
like yeah. the, I, they've got to be really intellectual first. But often it's it's really meeting people right where they're at, which means not expecting that they're going to change what they think yeah. um, and not trying to change what they think in that moment, but just dealing with their reality. You know, where are they coming from right now? Yeah. And that's really hard for me to do because I I'm like you. I like if I feel like someone's misunderstood me. Yeah. Right. Like I like I I've been accused. I'm sure you've had this experience in your own life. I'm I'm a very I mean, as I'm an ordained deacon in the church, I made a profession of faith and I made a promise of obedience. So I would never teach anything that the Catholic church doesn't, doesn't teach, profess, you know, or believe. But some people accuse me of, you know, not because, because I talk about things like the supernatural life of God and healing and, you know, like I get accused of that all the time. And I immediately want to just throw my credentials in there and go, no, but you don't understand. I'm, and honestly, that's, I very rarely found it helpful at all. Yeah. Yeah. Satisfying sometimes, right? (laughs) Like, like I, I'm going to push back but not helpful in terms of yeah. building a relationship or leading them closer to the Lord. Yeah. Because if you think about, about it in terms of this person is reacting so strongly because they've been triggered by something, yep. a trigger is it exists because they've been traumatized by something yep. and you're, they're reliving that trauma. And so what do you do if you are ministering to someone who's in trauma, you come in with gentleness, you come in with right. love and kindness. And so I think for me, that's what the shift was that took place is, Oh, I, they're not my enemy. They're hurting. They're, they're wounded. They're traumatized. And I said, or did something that pressed on that pain. And so I, I want to be coming in as the healer. Like I want to come in and not try to recapture my own reputation, but I actually want to come in and bring restoration to the areas that are hurting in them. I think that takes a lot of detachment, right. And, and a lot of humility because like you said, I, like I, it's my reputation, right? I want other people to think of me in a positive sense. Yeah. Right. Well, that's really beautiful. And, and it's essential when we talk about evangelization, when, yeah. you know, when you, when you talk about, uh, I love that, right. When you want to serve an individual or a people group, uh, you know, as you say, like you have to bring that, yeah. right. It's very wise. We've got a friend who does some overseeing of certain ministries and she coaches people and that sort of thing. She's a Christian. And she shared once that, she was really struggling with one of her students that she was supposed to be mentoring and was just like in a very, um, a bad mood and feeling very defensive Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And her, I think it was her boss said to her, yeah, so when are you meeting with the student? Oh, this afternoon. Yeah. You're going to need to cancel that appointment. And she said, why? And he said, you need to cancel the appointment until you can get to the place where you are thinking about this person with love and compassion, Mm. get your heart Mm. right before you even spend time with this person, because it's going to come out of you. Your disposition towards them is going to come out Mm. of you. And so cancel it and reschedule when your heart is better. And so she gave it about a week for her to Mm. recover from whatever pain and, you know, bad, whatever had stirred their relationship to to reach that point, she gave herself time to process and, you know, seek the Lord and, and acquire his heart for this student. And sure enough, when she had that appointment, she was able to come in with love and with so much more effectiveness in coaching them and bringing them closer to the Lord and ministering to them. Wow. That's really wise. Yeah. I've got, I mean, this is actually good. This is like a kind of like I'm being convicted as we speak right now, like, "Hmm, okay, I got some people that I need to apply that to. Mm. Right now, just just to get the heart of the father for them, and which means I have to ask. Often, I have to ask for it. Right? Yeah, it yeah. just doesn't normally. Just I you were sharing with me the other day with one situation where you're like, I actually just need to, I need to find this person on Google. I need to Google this person, pull up a picture, so I can actually like humanize this person, yeah. see them, and like, yeah. can I, you know, really be reminded of the humanity of the person in front of me and and reconnect with that place of love. Yeah. That's, that's my kind of trick in the book of if I'm feeling um, defensive or angry towards a person, even if it's someone who cuts me off in traffic, I make sure that the, the last thing I do before they blow past me is I turn and I look at their face because I need to see their face. Mm. If it's, you know, an, an online interaction, if I get an email from someone that I don't know, I Google them to see if I can find a picture of their face because I need to look into their eyes and see what God sees in them. And I, whether, mm. even if it's someone in traffic driving by me, all right, I need to see the child of God that is in that car yeah, or right. whoever's on the other side of that 
message and I need to feel what God feels towards them, which is always going to be love. That's beautiful. A practice I should probably adopt. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I track them down because I'm really angry and I want to, I want to, you know what I mean? I'm like, I need, I need ammunition. <laughs> that's the, that's the wrong attitude right there. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm always blown away when I talk with you. This, this concept of identity comes up over and over again, because I just think it's central to, I think it's just central to the reality of obviously who we are, it's identity, but it's, it's central to the, the issues in the church today, the issues in the, the lack of mission, lack of evangelization, and the lack of an experience and encounter with God's love. And so like, I always feel like, I mean, every message is important, right? I like, I just feel like all, the whole tradition is important, but like that priest said, like I've, Someone had told me the most important thing is that people would learn to love themselves. I, I think one of the one of the things that happens when the gospel is proclaimed is that people come face to face with the identity of the Father's love yeah. and then the identity of of who they are yeah. in light of the Father's love. And I think that's that allows the Holy Spirit then to bring real transformation. I think that's the that's essential for us in the 21st century as we're trying to share the gospel, right? It that Maybe maybe 500 years ago, 600 years ago, that wasn't the place, yeah. right? Maybe it was something else. But definitely now, as you guys have put your, your finger on it, as you're hearing it, is we're struggling with this and we, and we really need to help people. Yeah. And if there's, if there's anything we need to look to just in, in terms of like global or cultural trends, the search for identity is everywhere, right? Like this yeah. is people are casting out in every direction looking for identity and I think that kind of reinforces or, or brings it back to like, we need to do a better job of instilling that identity. And, I, and by identity, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean Catholic branding. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Right. So right. Not Catholic I, identity. I, right. That's yeah. what we're talking about. Like, who am I in relationship to the father? Like, how does he really see me? How does, who is he in his, in his true nature? And once those questions are, are settled, so many other issues of life get settled along with it. Mm-hmm.